Hi, welcome to Money No Object, which is our series where we look at the super high-end tech that us mere mortals don't normally get to see in real life. We're here in the studio with Bowers and Wilkins today for the launch of the new 700 Signature series and to compare it to this, the 801 Diamond series. So a lot of parts of the 700 Signature series are inspired by technology developed for the 801. That includes the tweeter on top design, which is extremely similar between both, but is made from different materials. Obviously, the much more expensive model has much more expensive materials. As you can see, that also includes the mid-range driver and the grill over it. Developed for the 801, but extremely similar technology goes into the 700 Signature Series to bring the same kind of open sound and transparency that you get from the super high-end one. Obviously, the principle between loudspeakers of different scales is more or less the same, but it really comes down to the engineering. What that means is that the construction is so elaborate and advanced in the 801 that each of these speakers weighs 100 kilograms. So the 700 series looks like it's made from a, you know, a kind of beautifully grained wood. It's actually an engineered man-made wood. The 700 signature series costs about £7,000, while the 801 diamond here costs about £36,000 for a pair. We're going to sit down with Andy Kerr from Bowers & Wilkins to talk about the difference between this model and stepping up to this one. First, tell us a little bit about the, the new 700 Signature and what your goal with this design was. Well, Signature is a really important name for us. I think the, the brand has a long heritage of doing, as you can obviously tell, pretty substantial high-end loudspeakers. The Signature name is really important because it has a kind of slightly emotional character to us. So um, the guy who originally founded the company, John Bowers, unfortunately, um, as he got later in life, contracted cancer and he died in 1987. And what the company, and particularly the research and development team that he hired, decided to do was kind of put out a loudspeaker that was essentially a homage to him. And they called it the, the Signature. The original model had a kind of handwritten name on it and so forth, which in theory at least was a good facsimile of his handwriting style. And the premise was that what it did was it kind of encapsulated all of the knowledge and all of the engineering understanding that we'd had up until that point, and then turned everything up to 11. So any signature loudspeaker, and obviously this is one, the latest one, has the most advanced driving unit technology, component parts, stuff that we can feasibly incorporate within it, plus a very celebratory, luxurious standard of finish, designed to make it stand out even from our own regular products. So essentially, we don't do it very often. It is quite special. Um, there have been only seven generations of signature up until this point. This is the latest one, the eighth, and the premise is very much uh, you buy something that's unique, relatively special, relatively high performance, we'd like to think, um, and true to the ideals that kind of drive what we are as a brand. So when you speak about the luxurious finish and the, the high-end components, what price are we talking about for the 700? Well, £7,000, but you do get two, um, which we consider to be good value. Um, the premise behind a pair of 702s is the bits that are inside it that kind of enable it and offer some of the, the really transparent character that it has um, come, come from the 801, come from the flagship loudspeaker, or at least are inspired by that. So driving it technology is obviously one really key thing to delivering that high performance. It has a, a high frequency drive unit, a tweeter, Hi-Fi industry is good, full of good names, a tweeter which is made um, from carbon braced aluminium. So it's quite exotic in how it comes together. Uh, the elements inside it itself are also continuously upgraded throughout, again inspired by a lot of the knowledge from that. And as you can see, the other part of it is that finish. It comes in two, we like to think, rather resplendent finishes. That one's called Datuk. Um, it's actually an engineered wood. The reason we choose to use engineered wood is you, you really can't get highly grained, highly figured wood like this uh, without being irresponsible to the rainforest. And clearly we're not going to do that, right? So engineered wood is um, man-made and then it's stained or dyed to create the character. Um, so this is related to an ebony, it's not. Um, it's called Datuk um, and it's engineered to create that look and feel. So you get this really strong, uh, vibrant kind of figuring and no two pair are the same. They've all got their own unique character. As I said, unique is a big part of the story with Signature. And so when you're engineering that wood, are you really designing it around the acoustic signature that you want from the speakers? Well, that's a good question. So um, if you think about a loudspeaker cabinet rather like the chassis in a racing car. So uh, effectively, the more stiff mechanically the chassis in a racing car is, the faster the racing car will go around the circuit because the suspension will, will, will be more compliant, will be more effective. In a loudspeaker, it's the same thing. So 
The wood that Ira is referring to is essentially just the outer layer. That's the wrapping over the top of the main construction, and it's the bit that you see. But the engineering stuff inside it is made from different materials, and it's built to a standard that's not so much about how it looks as about how it works. And the key thing we want to try to do is minimise unwanted vibration. If a loudspeaker box vibrates, it makes noise. If it makes noise, it's making sound that is unwanted, sound that should not be there. And that, what, that's essentially what gets in the way of good music. And this is what you mean when you said it's engineered for transparency, mm. which is, by transparency you mean you can just uh, see through everything else and just focus on the music, nothing well, else uh, interfering with it? I mean, lesson number one that we always say to people who start working with us in our engineering team is nobody buys a pair of loudspeakers to, to listen to loudspeakers. You know, you buy loudspeakers to listen to music. That's the point, that's what they're for. So the idea of what we try to do is to get out of the way of the original, you know, the signal, if you like, and try and allow it to come forward into the room. So what you should hear is the authenticity of the recording, the actual intent behind the piece of music. I say that because I think sometimes the hi-fi industry has, for want of a better word, misunderstood the message. Sometimes we have a habit of saying everything should be pure. With the greatest of respect, there's nothing pure about the Stooges or you know, those sorts of pieces of music. What we want to be is authentic. So if the piece of music is designed to be sweet and beautiful and accurate and all those sorts of things, that's great. If it's supposed to make you want to run around the room screaming because it's rock and roll, then that's fine too. Uh, so authenticity is our big thing. So don't allow the audio to be colored, changed, modified. Deliver it in the truest possible form to the original piece of music. So the, the purpose of kind of increasingly elaborate engineering is actually to remove the engineering from the equation. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, a long, long time ago, John Bowers said that the perfect loudspeaker should be like a flawless pane of glass. It should allow you to essentially see through. This is why these things get used a lot in recording studios. It's a very big part of our DNA. Um, and again, right from the start. So, so, you know, our first generations of loudspeakers were called domestic monitors. Now, monitor is a piece of language that's used a lot in recording studios. The point is nobody working in a recording studio wants to hear our interpretation of what the music should be. They want to hear what they're hearing, the other side of that pane of glass, in the recording studio. They want to hear the artist, the other side of that pane of glass, as real as it possibly can be. So that's what we try to do. Um, now clearly, you have to flex and take your choices, right? If you're spending 600 pounds, as opposed to 36,000 pounds, then certain engineering choices have to be adapted to make sure that you're hitting the right points. But nonetheless, that's always the intent. So speaking of recording studios, elaborate engineering and 36,000 pounds, tell us a little more about the, the 801. So these are used in Abbey Road. Yeah, that's the latest generation of 801, which is um, what we call the D4, the fourth generation of diamond. It's really important to us. It's, it's, it's the icon of our business and it goes back a long way. The thing I always say to people about the 800 series is, Let's be honest, a good number of people have probably, you know, they've never heard or experienced a high-end loudspeaker like this, which I, I fully understand. The reality is they kind of have, but they weren't aware of it because unwittingly this loudspeaker has contributed to their lives. It's been used in a great many different recording studios across the world, not just Abbey Road Studios, of course, we're tremendously proud of that, but there are lots of other recording studios as well that use the product in various generations. But going back to 1980, the first generation of the original 801 was delivered in 1980 to Abbey Road Studios and several months after it was delivered it was used to help record the soundtrack for Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then shortly after that it was used for the soundtrack for Return of the Jedi. And then subsequently it's been used on Pirates of the Caribbean and Jurassic Park and Aliens and Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and the list just goes on and on and on. So you've experienced what they have to offer even if you didn't know it because those soundtracks were shaped by the character and the quality of the loudspeaker. Just as surely as Radiohead or any you know, major contemporary popular artist that you might want to think of. The speakers used to create accuracy, convey accuracy, which then delivers more realistic and believable music experiences, which then in turn contribute to how you listen. So the, the tweeter design and the mid-range design from the 801 have been carried through to the 700. They'd sef they definitely inspired it. As you can see, there's a lot of commonality in the form, the shape which we call um, the tweeter on top, that elongated tube that you can see at the top of the structure, as you can see, is, is present in that one too. Um, as is the grill mesh, as is, you can see, the, the cone, the mid-range cone here, that one. Um, obviously with an 801, because we've got more scope, because it's a 
significantly more higher loudspeaker, we can house that construction in somewhat more exotic material. So this is a wooden cabinet. That's 18 kilograms of cast aluminium sitting on top of the loudspeaker, which is what's called the turbine head. And you're just talking about this top bit I'm for the 18 just, kilograms? I'm literally just talking about there. A complete system is over 100 kilograms, yeah. Um, the other part is, is the materials that are used at the very top. So the diamond dome there is not just a marketing name, it, it actually is composed of um, synthetically grown diamond uh, under a process called chemical vapour deposition. So it's uh, supremely stiff, it's very, very thin, 40 micron, um, and phenomenally stiff, which in turn means it's very accurate in how it behaves. This model being somewhat more affordable, we have similar thinking, but we have to use a more affordable set of materials. So this model has um, an aluminium dome, which is then braced by an outer coating of carbon particles. And carbon obviously is related to diamond, um, but not quite the same in terms of either cost or overall performance, but still very good at the level. So we're talking ultimately about taking the principles you use here to do the, the very best stuff, fitting it into something more affordable, certainly relatively speaking compared to these, but the the difference between the ultimate in loudspeaker technology and the kind of the version that's more likely to make it into someone's home is mainly that how um, elaborately you can express the engineering goals uh, that you're striving for. I think you adapt your choices, right? I mean, I think, look, let's put it in context. Were you in a fortunate enough position to have a pair of those, then you'd probably need to have an appropriate room everything else around them would also need to be appropriate as well. You're talking about a limited number of potential consumers per annum who might want to step into that world. And as many of those are likely music professionals as they are home users. So if you think about that like our mission to Mars or something like that, it's that. It represents our, our aspirational moonshot. It's everything that we know in terms of engineering and we go as far as we possibly can in each generation, no stone unturned. This is a domestic loudspeaker. This is inspired by everything that we know from that, but this is orders of magnitude more affordable. As you can see, somewhat more svelte. It's still not exactly tiny, but it's somewhat more svelte. It's designed to go into your listening room or your home. It's designed to be easier to live with, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have so many demands on the other components that you use with it. So it's about adapting choices. Again, go back on my earlier point, even our entry level, in our world, entry level loudspeaker of sort of six or 700 pounds, is to a degree inspired by that. Commonality of certain materials for sure, but clearly not diamonds and 18 kilograms of aluminium because that would cost more than the entire loudspeaker. Andy, thank you so much for joining us for this. Um, I can't wait to hear the 700 in action um, and congratulations on the launch. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. So that's what goes into making a super high-end set of speakers or a still high-end but much more affordable set of speakers. Uh, if you had that kind of money, is this what you'd spend it on? Let us know in the comments.